marker. So, you want to talk about the movies, huh? Well, start talking. Okay. Your generation of young actors was one of the first, that, or last, that was groomed for stardom. What did that involve at Universal? They had a program, didn't they? They did, but uh, you've got to remember it was more than just the Universal program. Uh, it was like shotgunning. There was no real program anywhere. The war was over. All the major players in films slowly disappeared during the war. During the war years, a lot of little kids started growing up and they didn't have any heroes. Tyrone Power was not their hero. Errol Flynn was not their hero. Cary Grant was not. John Wayne wasn't. They wanted a whole slew of new people. And it was just by accident that Tony Curtis, Marlon Brando, Rock Hudson, R.J. Wagner, John Derrick, a whole slew of us came along, got into movies at that same time. So you see, all the studios had little programs going. It wasn't as if Universal was so smart and said, we will now develop young players. They didn't know what to develop. Even the film, they didn't know what to develop. It was just by accident. And it was a very fortuitous period of time, you know? Especially for guys like me who wanted to get into movies. We were the right age, 22, 21, 20, 23, right? The war was over. Uh, you could make 50 bucks a week at a studio. I was making 50 bucks a week. They put me under a seven-year contract. Every six months, they'd pick up my option. At the end of two years, I'd be making 150 bucks. You can't park a car today for 150 bucks. But it was different. It was laid back. It was beautiful, you know? The freeway was no freeway. It was just a trolley car taking you to Lancashire Boulevard, and there I was at Universal. So that was, in essence, what that was. The training was quite simple. They taught you how to ride a horse, speak, walk, talk, stand up, sit down. That's what it was all about. But the most important for me, am I talking too much? No. The most important for me was that I got a chance to go on the set and I saw the work. This is on the job training. You don't get it anywhere. You can't get it in a school. Lee Strasberg School of Acting, forget it. It's garbage city, it means nothing. They took the idiosyncrasy and the genius of one man, Marlon Brando, and they made a school out of it. How many actors do you know play like him? It wasn't. You needed on-the-job training. You had to figure out the proximity of the camera, the other person you were talking to, how to solidify your, integ your intensity, you know? And so I am, I am a living proof of what movies are about in a way, you know? Well, they, they tried to, you know, temper your speech, change your speech, take the, the, the New York out of your speech. There was no way they were going to do that. But why would they want to do that? Would they want to do that with some English actor? What was wrong with my speech? What's wrong with being born in New York City? Marlon Brando came out and did On the Waterfront, bam! You didn't see him coming out and saying, yonder lies the castle of my father. I did it because I said, listen, if this is what the job was like. Uh, at MGM, they had a woman named... Uh, uh, Fogel, Fogel, Eleanor Fogel, I may have the first ring wrong. She was their speech instructor. And uh, uh, Bob Palmer, who was head of casting at Universal, said, I've arranged for Miss Fogler, Miss Fogler, to uh, uh, listen to your speech. Maybe she can help you. I said, okay, by me. So I drive all the way out to Culver City to the MGM studios, and I go into this tiny little building where Miss Fogler, with photographs of all actors, uh, you know, and she said, uh, uh, and we talked for a moment, she said, well, there's nothing really wrong with your speech. It's just certain, you drop certain vowels and you need a little help. Let us start out with some marbles, which was okay. And she gives me four marbles. It's a true story. And I said, uh, what would you like me to do with them? She says, put them in your mouth. So I'm putting four more in she says, She says to me, the rains in Spain fall mainly on the plain. I went, the rain in Spain, and I swallowed one. <coughs> I said, I swallowed one of your marbles. She said, that's all right, I have plenty more. I said, but I'll get it back to you next week sometime. I go back to the studio, and uh, there's Bob Palmer. He says, well, how did your first speech class go? I said, perfect. I'll never say Tidy Tide Street on Third Avenue ever again. <laughs> And that was the end of my speech classes. <laughs> they were so funny. You know, they, they took us 
people that were, we were so natural in our youth and in our exuberance. The war was over. We had all served in the services. You know, we were, we were, I was born and raised in Manhattan, New York. You know, I was born in the streets, then fought in a war, and there I am, not even 23 yet. <laughs> you had a war veteran, had been halfway around the world, you know, and they're treat, uh, treating us like ding-dongs. But that's what usually happens with adults, taking, you know, if we treat our young people like we're ding-dings, you know, when in fact they didn't allow us the privilege of expressing ourselves the way we wanted. One or two of us did, Marlon Brando, you see, he, he had enough courage of his own conviction and he was developed enough personally to allow himself to express that. He wasn't intimidated by some gruff guy with a big cigar. Let me ask you, there's a famous story when you were stabbed. Yeah. What? Just stabbed. There's a, an often told story about when, when, when you were um, in the war and you were aboard a ship and you had one movie that you got to see all Gunga Din. McChesney, get out of my way. It was Cary Grant. I did Cary Grant everywhere I went. Hello, Judy. Judy, Judy, Judy. I've got a pebble in my left boot. Did you? Uh, he was always an idol of yours. Right? Always. Him, Jimmy Cagney, Errol Flynn. But all of those guys had to be. I was raised in the 30s. I was born 1925, so by the time sound movies came around, I was old enough to go. I, I went, I'm sure, before and saw a silent film, but I was five, six, seven when these guys started to talk on the screen. Excuse me. Uh, I don't really remember, but it must have been an incredible shock to my nervous system. Oh, hold on one second, there's a refrigerator. Did you hear that? Yeah, I do, hang on. Cut, please. Cut. It was a, you know, it was a... No, where were we? We were talking about how you, you hero-worshipped all the great stars yes. in the 30s and 40s. Well, they were important to me. They taught me how to talk to a woman, how to walk across a room, how to tie a tie, how to walk into a restaurant, how to order dinner, how to smoke a cigarette, how to get out of a cab, how to leave a tip. Hey, they, these guys taught all of us these basic elements of living. Before the movies, there was nobody to teach you that. Where would a kid in a poor neighborhood learn how to tie a beautiful Windsor knot if he didn't have somebody to emulate, somebody to see you in a movie? Cary Grant just, I loved the way he dressed. He was just so chic and vest. My father being a tailor, I'd say, please make me a vest, and he'd make me a vest. So all of a sudden there was a miniature Cary Grant running around in Manhattan named Bernard Schwartz. You know, but that's what I learned from movies, and that's what I learned from these guys. Uh, Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., so many of them, Bela Lugosi. He was the most impeccable dresser of all of them, Bela Lugosi. In all those, uh, in all those uh, Dracula movies, his clothes were beautifully tailored. One of the, the most charming parts of Some Like It Hot, in fact, is your, your kind of, your tribute to Cary Grant. Yes. My, uh, we weren't sure what to do, you know? Uh, it, was, it, it wasn't complicated. I just, I wanted to play an, a, a very wealthy person and I, there was nothing I could do to do that, you know? I didn't want to change my own speech pattern, which was quite whatever it was, and then the girl's voice was something else again. So I said to Billy Wilder that morning that we did the first scene, which was sitting on the beach where I hold up the shell, uh, that was the first day we shot it, and before we do the shot, I, I, I says, uh, Billy, what would you think if I talked like that? He says, I like it, Tony. I said, well, I'll do it. He said, do it. We did it, and then after a few days working, they, you could begin to hear a little bit of Cary Grant. When the movie was over, he ran the picture for Cary, and he said to Cary, Cary, he said, how did you like Tony's impression of you? Cary said, I don't talk like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't talk like that. <laughs> That's great. I want to go back to, to your, um, your rise to stardom in, in the early days. One of the things that, that you've had throughout your career is you've always been very cooperative with the press and doing publicity stunts and all. And early on in your career, there, uh, tell, tell about that publicity stunt of, of when, when Tony Curtis broke. Well, somebody won me in a movie magazine. Uh, uh, write a paragraph about something and win Tony Curtis for the weekend. Somebody in Walla Walla, Washington won me. And when I got to Walla Walla, Washington, I think it was Modern Screen, could have been the magazine, there were a whole slew of them. And I arrive and 
this woman, uh, I'm going to stay at their house. And uh, I arrived with a lot of fanfare, a lot of photography, photographs, and it's only for the movie magazines. And it wasn't anything newsworthy in those days. You know, no one knew who I was or what I was connected to, you know. So uh, we go out to her house, and she's certainly nice enough, but she seems a little aloof. And I finally said, well, I'm so happy that, you know, that I had a chance to be with you and that you won first prize. She said, well, I really didn't want to win you. I said, you didn't? She said, I wanted the second prize, the fridge. I says, oh, I'm so sorry. She said, oh, that's all right. We'll make the best of it. So she, she took care of me for the weekend. <laughs> I want some blot. You want some what? Blot. You want some what? Blot. Blot? Here. Yeah. Yeah. No, you. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, talking about publicity, certainly your marriage to Janet Lee was one of the most publicized. Is it true that both your studios opposed the marriage initially? Uh, yeah, I would think so. I think Universal did. I was just uh, starting out, and there was a tremendous amount of, uh, of attention paid to me uh, getting started, and they felt that being married would hinder or hurt a film career. They weren't concerned so much about me as they were about, uh, you know, uh, they were building a screen idol, they thought, and they didn't think it would help. Didn't hurt. No, you know, I was on the move, and nothing was going to stop me, certainly not a marriage. You know, and uh, so there was that kind of, but I, I got to dislike the studio system because of it. You know, they, in, they got too involved in my life. You know, I didn't feel it was necessary to get that involved in it, you know. So there was a lot of stress and tension connected with that. And it set the seeds for our divorce. You see, it began the seeds of discontent between the two of us. You know, one said, well, he's using Janet Lee to improve his career. She's using him to get, because he's so hot now, to get his, her picture in movie magazine. And this was the rumors that went back and forth. And I'm sure it entered both our mind when we'd hear about it. So you see, that was a very bad um, experience and very difficult. It also must have been hard to live up to the billing of Hollywood's perfect couple. Well, we, we, we try to, you know, uh, well, I don't say we try to, but we try to make a life for ourselves, you know. We had a nice apartment on Wilshire Boulevard, and we really tried to make a little home for ourselves. But it was awfully hard, you know. I would, uh, you know, in those days, I spent 14, 16 hours a day on a set. I'd show up at 6 in the morning. I wouldn't go home until 9, 10 at night. We'd have these breaks, but the breaks didn't mean anything, you know. And we'd, I'd get, get home at 9, quarter to 9, I'd have to run get dressed up in a black dinner suit and go to Billy Wilder's dinner party, stay there until 11, 30, 12, go dancing till 1, 15, and then go home, get up. You know, it, it was exhausting, exhausting. And it was part of the social environment. That's what movies were about in those days. Your social life and your professional life kind of blended, you know. And there was nothing you could do to uh, not have that blend. And that had a dire effect on a lot of marriages. Also during this period, you were really starting to become the kind of actor you wanted to be. You were getting late 50s, some great roles. And, and I could have handled them when I was a kid. I did the best job a 22-year-old guy could do on the screen. I was handsome, handsomer than anybody around. I had a good figure. I could do anything. But nobody gave me the chance, honey. They didn't do it. They stuck me in bloomers with a sword on my hip. You know, I could have been playing all of these great parts then. I, uh, I didn't learn to act later. I was on the job training. The fact that I had this clumsy dialogue that had to pour out of my mouth was not my fault. I'm not saying, but there isn't a movie I made that I'm embarrassed about. Not one. Can I have a plane, please? I beg your pardon? A plane. Yeah, yeah. Cut. Yeah, I'll get you. I'll get you. I heard a great story when you were talking about how uh, you weren't given the chance to, do, or or given the you know the, the recognition for for your abilities. I heard a great story about what Lou Wasserman did with you once. He took you to the library. Could you tell that story? Please, I need a little more information. Oh, it was he took you to the library. He said, "Here's a book of Stanislavski. Here's a you know." Yeah, right. He gave me yeah. He gave me all these books. He said, "See these books? They mean absolutely nothing. Forget about them." 
He says, don't do anything. Just learn about yourself. Just the only one that can screw up a career, this is what he said to me, is yourself, nobody else. He says, don't let them try to paint you into something or be someone else. You know way before anybody else who you are and what you are. And that's what you should aim for. He said, this place is loaded with books on acting. There are films on acting. Forget it. Forget it. There's no acting on the screen. Acting on the screen it must be so artful that it's artless. You must not be aware of it. When I go to the movie and I become aware of acting, I get up and I leave and ask for my money back. How do you like to go to the movie and see a detective looking at some dead, gruesome body that somebody threw out of a window, and there he's got white shadow under his eyes. Mm -hmm. He's got his hair nicely coiffed, mm -hmm. little rouge on his cheek. What kind of a policeman is that? I mean, that's what they do. So, so you've got to be very careful. And I learned that. I learned that from Cary Grant, too. He once told me that the way you judge a bottle of white wine is that when it's chilled, it tastes like a cool glass of water. It's so artful, it's artless. And I immediately attributed that to my profession. So, so in a lot of ways, a lot of people, by not knowing you're doing it, don't think you're doing it. So some of us have favorites in movies, you know. I've never won an award for acting. I've won it for good looks, for clothing, for popularity, taking out the most girls. What else did I win it for? Uh, having the best-looking cars around. I won it for everything. Uh, and I, I was, I, it, it hurt me a long time ago, you know. It doesn't anymore. It doesn't, because I see it's, uh, it's invaluable. There's no value to acting. Acting is not acting. It's, it's a sense of being. Hamlet says to be or not to be, in a different context, of course. But for me, it is to be. To be. If you be, then you see. And if you see, then you are. Simple. Simple. You just memorize the lines and learn about it. If you haven't had the experience of someone dying in your family, someone died in your family. So what are you going to do? You've got to act, you know, you've got to find something inside of you that's going to help you achieve that. You're not going to b become mechanical with it. 